we thought the proposed rule was bad. And last year, Missouri Farm Bureau showed you some maps of what we thought that was going to look like. Uh, but when the final rule came out, we knew we needed to, there were so many changes and it was so much worse, and we knew we needed to map them again. So we, uh, we partnered with uh, Geosyntec Consulting, um, based all over the world, but they've got some offices in Columbia, to take a look at, at layering all of these different definitions that come out of the final rule to see what it really looks like um, on, on the ground. So we focused, uh, we focused on three research, area, research farms in Missouri. Um, the maps I'm going to show you and go into detail this morning are from uh, Linnaeus, Missouri in Lynn County. Um, the area we're going to focus on is seven and a half miles wide and four and a half miles tall. Uh, and it includes the University of Missouri's Forage Systems Research, Research Center. So uh, we did this through five different layers. The first layer here is what we would generally concern, uh, consider jurisdictional today. These are intermittent and perennial streams, those streams that have water in them most of the year. Um, they are shown on the, with these blue lines. Uh, and the green areas around them are, are wetlands. The next layer is using EPA's new revised definition of what is a, a jurisdictional water. They now include ephemer ephemeral tributaries, which most of us wouldn't necessarily recognize as a tributary most of the year, because water only flows through it portions of the year. You'll see all of these red lines are these new features that are going to be considered waters of the United States. I think it's important to note that this doesn't capture all of them. This is as close as we could get um, with the technology that we have, but it certainly doesn't capture all of the ditches that are potentially jurisdictional. Next, we add a layer where we put a 100-foot buffer around uh, the new WOTUS. Um, any water within 100 feet of these uh, jurisdictional waters, um, and that includes wetlands and, and farm ponds, are now jurisdictional. You'll notice as we go through these that we treat intermittent, perennial, and ephemeral features all the same. So a ditch on your, uh, next to your farm is treated the same as the Missouri River. Next, all of that green shading is 1,500 feet around all of those features. Any water, again, including wetlands, where any part is within the 100-year floodplain and within 1,500 feet of that feature is now jurisdictional. Now you'll see the, the floodplains are these yellow hash marks. And you'll notice that they're only really assigned around those features that we traditionally considered WOTUS. There will be floodplains around all of these ephemeral features, but we haven't gotten around to putting those features in yet. So what's a, a farmer to do? Well, until you know better, assume 1,500 feet. Now, over here, and this little, do you see when I flip between there, that little orange patch that pops up? Within, there's another buffer, 4,000 feet, which is about three quarters of a mile, around any tributary can be regulated on a significant nexus basis. So if you can prove some chemical or biological connection between that water that's on that particular patch and those areas around it, it's now jurisdictional. Linnaeus isn't very, is very similar to the rest of the state. We're not cherry picking an example to show what, that this is, is um, worse than it is. This is the entire state. So why should you try to identify waters on your land and farm? There's some pretty significant uh, uh, penalties and, uh, and fines associated with um, disrupting a water of the United States if you haven't sought a permit. So for example, if you have a grass waterway running through your field, you've grassed it over according to NRCS standards to try to keep it from growing, and that's considered an ephemeral feature, any planting of grass you should probably get a permit for, or any spraying of pesticide in that area you should get a permit for. Or what if you change the, the, the structure of your ditch somewhat to keep it from growing? Well, that should be, you should have gotten a, a permit for that because that required a dredge and fill permit. So I mentioned earlier the Forage Research Center. These are photos the university took and included. Um, picturesque, right? They're the best in the business. Um, I bet some of their, their fencing probably wouldn't meet some of the standards that EPA tells us uh, we need to follow in order to have our exemptions. So this is that farm. You'll notice uh, in the blue area, 
There's only one stream that goes through it that's jurisdictional today. When I apply all the filters, look at all the, the red lines, the, the hash marks for the, um, the wetlands, the entire area is within 1,500 feet. WordAC Research Center, um, some of you all are probably familiar with that, nestled along the Ozarks. Uh, that mama cow and her calf are probably a little too close to our waters of the United States. Here's what it looks like today. Here's what it looks like under the new rules. And then Hunley Whaley uh, on the outskirts of Albany. This is what it looks like today. This is what it looks like under the new rule. Uh, this is pretty significant stuff. And again, we're not cherry picking. Um, there's 44 million acres in the state of Missouri. 7% uh, of them are within 100 feet of a jurisdictional water. 92% of them are within 1,500 feet of a jurisdictional water. 99.7% of your state is within 4,000 feet of, a, of a, a potential WOTUS. So this is going to have an impact not just on these research farms that we picked, but all across the state. The issue of federal regulatory overreach isn't new, but the cumulative effects of new impending rulemakings are serious and cannot be ignored. Stopping the Environmental Protection Agency's words of the U.S. final rule is a top priority for our organization. Uh, this is a jurisdictional level that if the federal government gets it, you could never adequately exercise it. It is way more jurisdiction than anybody would ever want to have in a rational world. These decisions, if they need to be made by government, need to be made much closer to where people are. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is just den deny the money. And so hopefully between now and the time the government is funded for next year, there'll be no money available to enforce this rule. And hopefully by the time people have a chance to think about this rule, they'll say, we, we are not going to allow the EPA to go in that direction. Now the Clean Water Act is a law, and they are trying to change law by rule. They can't do that, that's not legal. So I think at some point, the groups will get together, challenge this rule, and take it to court. I don't see any way they can, they can lose the case because you cannot change a law by rule. When you look at this map, and you look at what we're facing, it boils down to one thing that this administration is doing. And I say it's war on rural America. But what we have to continue to do to keep pushing back on this administration so that we can con continue to fight for our rural way of life, so that we can be left alone, the federal government can be out of our way, and we can just survive. This is, this rule, the waters of the U.S., is the most comprehensive, largest federal land grab in our nation's history. And that's what it is. It is the federal government now controlling, wanting to control 99% of the property in this country, and thus controlling us, the property owners and people, and controlling what we can do in our land. This is the coalition that has come together to oppose WOTUS. As you see, there's people from all over the state of Missouri, all different kinds of business, because that's how wide-ranging the rule is. That's how many people it affect in the state.